Okay. Hello there and welcome. I'm Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. On behalf of HDC, thank you so much for spending uh, this e part of this evening with us. I hope everybody is keeping well and um, keeping yourself safe, uh, healthy, and entertained. We're going to start off this little presentation, which is part of our preservation school, um, with a short commercial video about the Historic Districts Council, which we are slightly proud of, and then I'm going to go into it. Um, as I'd mentioned, we will be keeping everyone muted, but you can, uh, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, um, and if we have time, at the end of this, we'll open it up for some Q&A. Uh, the Preservation School program is sponsored by our friends at the New York City Council, the New York State Council on the Arts, for which we are incredibly grateful to both of them. Uh, this is only our second online Zoom video. Uh, I apologize for the questionable lighting that you're going to be seeing me. Hopefully, we're actually going to be looking at a, at a screen of a PowerPoint, but um, you know these narrow old apartment buildings. Um, you get your light where you can. So let me go to the uh, to our little HTC promo video first. Preservation is a shared value. It depends on the strong bonds of community and hope to succeed. It doesn't happen overnight or in just one afternoon, but that's okay. Preservationists are good at this. We naturally take the long view. Hi, I'm Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. For 50 years, HDC has been helping to save and restore the treasures of New York City. Now that we're spending more time at home and in our neighborhoods and boroughs, it's essential that we protect what's around us. We're the organization that has provided over 40 neighborhood guides to the city and has virtual tours coming directly to you. We're the hope that ensures our history won't be forgotten, but protected. And we're here to weather this crisis with you. Please consider supporting the Historic Districts Council. It's more important than ever for us to have a voice in what happens to our neighborhoods. Okay, well, uh, thank you again. I am uh, Simeon Bankoff in much uh, worse lighting than I was in that video. Um, and welcome to Preservation School. Hold on, let me just get my presentation up. I also hear that my uh, ice cream truck is, is coming by, so uh, I'm probably gonna have to speak louder. The ice cream truck usually comes by my neighborhood, usually around 10, 15 every night, um, usually from about February through November. I've always wondered who really needs ice cream at 10, 15 on, in November, but I try not to ask questions like that too much. Ah, uh, the sounds of the city. Okay, so welcome. We are the Historic Districts Council. HTC is the advocate for New York City's designated historic districts and for neighborhoods meriting preservation. We're dedicated to protecting the integrity of New York City's landmarks law and to furthering the preservation ethic. This year we turn 50, so we actually have a temporary logo, you can tell, to, uh, to commemorate this. Um, Unfortunately, because of circumstances, we have been, had to change some of our plans, but we are actually still going ahead with the creation of a, a timeline and a whole exhibit that will be done online with our colleagues and um, partners at Urban Archives. So stay tuned for that. It should be fun. We were formed in 1970 as a coalition of individuals and community groups from the city's designated historic districts and potential historic districts. Our primary constituency is over 500 neighborhood-based groups. We service these groups and our mission through three principal program activities, 
community outreach, education, and advocacy. With regards to community outreach, we provide strategic advice for community groups, um, how they can organize, how they can uh, get in touch with their elected officials, um, even to points of how do they create themselves and formalize themselves as a community group. We also provide forums for communities to meet their elected officials. Over there on the right, you see council member Ben Kalos presenting at one of our conferences. Our education panels, of which this is one of them, we have an annual conference on broad preservation and planning topics. In fact, uh, this year it was on uh, March 7th before the stay at home order happened. Um, and we also have regular classes on community organizing, building research, political outreach, and this, of course, Preservation 101. Um, and finally, our advocacy, which is really the third pillar of our principal activities. We are the only organization that uh, test, that reviews every single public proposal that affects historic, historic buildings in the five boroughs and comments upon them at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. In fact, we were the first uh, applicant, uh, we were the first uh, member of the public to testify in the LPC's new online uh, hearings that are going on. Uh, the next one, which will be on Tuesday, you should check them out at least on YouTube. They're kind of fun and actually uh, watching them online, it's a lot clearer than sitting in uh, the <clears throat> public hearing room with kind of questionable and dodgy uh, here, a uh, dodgy sound system. We also advocate for the designation of specific neighborhoods and buildings over here on the right. You will see this is uh, the Gowanus, this one of our tours of the Gowanus Canal. In fact, the building behind, the, um, the white building behind them is the ASPCA building that was recently designated as a New York City landmark. Now, what is preservation? I've been talking about preservation a lot. Um, and uh, so let's let's kind of get into that a bit. Preservation is the idea that the retention and perpetuation of physical evidence of history is a societal good. Um, it's just, it creates a foundation, that notion creates a foundation for community building. It enables you to build something based on the past. It engages people uh, to, to uh, really interact with the existing physical environment to give them agency and to give them a reason to, and a way of affecting the world around them. And it provides an anchor point within the vast space of time. Frankly, and, and I don't know about you all, but um, there, there's this sort of deep well of, existen of potential existential despair that exists within society um, where you feel adrift. And by engaging in preservation, by engaging with a community to try to affect your environment, you can find an anchor point there. And you can also find um, sort of a place to stand within this huge world. Um, preserving historic buildings has a multitude of, of social and economic benefits. Uh, historic preservation effect, uh, attracts visitors. Uh, this is slightly old information. It's only increased since then. Over 54 million people visited New York City in 2013, um, it was, it was it last stats I had seen was for 2019 was about 75 million. And uh, historic landmarks throughout the boroughs attracted both international and domestic tourists. In some cases, um, 50 or 50% 50 or higher visited historic landmarks. So that's, that's multitudes of millions of people. And it enhanced tourism by that matter. Those visitors spent $38 billion in 2013, and that generated 20, more than $20 billion in wages, and they were going to historic landmarks. Those are tourist attractions. This is a major driver um, in, in, all the, in all the world cities, but particularly in New York City. Um, it also supports better jobs. Again, we're in old information and we need to update it, but back from 2001 to 2013, there were 24,000 new jobs in, uh, in construction that came and historic preservation creates proportionally more jobs than new construction and higher paying jobs than new construction because the very notion is that historic rehabilitation using preservation practices actually you spend more on labor and less on materials as opposed to new construction where the majority of money actually comes from, uh, you know, it gets halved into labor and materials. 
Historic preservation also, um, excuse me, uh, generates investment in properties, that there's a 20% tax credit that income producing properties can make uh, for doing substantial renovations to historic preservation, uh, to historic properties, and it generates uh, reinvestment in throughout New York City. This, uh, this credit still exists and in fact has been renewed and they are even looking at supplementing or perhaps even increasing it during the COVID crisis in order to help jumpstart the economy. Okay. Um, but the real important of preservation, importance of preservation is the continued existence of a shared path, of a physical past is essentially important to the stability of a shared culture because it's an ugly thing to live in a timeless place. Um, this is uh, the remains of a uh, Admiral's Row in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. There were a series of late 19th century mansions that were torn down for an above ground parking garage and a Wegmans that everybody is very excited about, but frankly, it's a supermarket. So what are the strategies of preservation? There are basically three strategies of preservation. Um, which if, if you are the sort of person who likes to do this, you can call them the ABCs. A, being accept the inevitability of change and make peace with yourself. B, is buying the property. And C, is controlling the property. So with regard to accepting the inevitability of change, you know, here's an old uh, cartoon from The New Yorker. Uh, I love my new neighborhood, all the beautiful architecture. We are old New York character. The grit's still here. It's all right here for me, right at my feet. I'm just glad I got here before it's ruined. And then you see where he's coming from, that the actual ruiner itself is the person who does this. Now, um, you can turn this on its head and say, look, you've got a, a, a you now you, you have five, um, probably wealthier people who are now invested in the neighborhood, but still. If you accept the inevitability of, of preservation, of the inevitability of change within the cityscape, uh, you can, might be able to find some peace, or you might end up writing a couple of books about it. There are some wonderful books about, you know, how a great city lost its soul or St. Mark's is dead. Um, which are really great polemics to read to understand the importance of why we need to um, strive to protect what we have. Now, moving, aside, moving ahead to constructive ways of doing this, you can try to buy the property yourself. This is, for example, um, architect Joseph Pell Lombardi bought the Octagon House in Irvington on Hudson. He owns the place, he's restored it beautifully. It is a wonderful place and uh, he's l we're lucky enough that it's held by a great steward. Unfortunately, not everybody is in that position, or sometimes it's not possible for you to buy the house yourself, but you can get someone you trust to buy the property. Um, and there are uh, indeed, you know, some people are, you know, the Parks Department, the Historic House Trust of New York City, who is a partner of the Parks Department, oversees over two dozen historic house museums in New York, one of which is the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum Alliance that runs the Dykeman House. Um, which is up in northern Manhattan in Inwood, one of the oldest houses in New York, in Manhattan, that is interpreted as a, as a museum. Um, so that is a possibility. Um, but in order to do that, you really need to build a political push to to get an entity, usually a public entity, to acquire the property that's so important to your community. And by doing, doing that, you need to act in coalition. Um, there are many benefits of acting in coalition. Uh, there are, it, it creates increased resources because it takes people to accomplish things. It's increased outreach because people know people. Everybody has a different network of friends and contacts. And those friends and contacts have different skills because not everyone can do, no one can do everything, but everybody can do something. Uh, more often than not, people are saying, well, how could I, for example, do an online petition? I have no clue. Well, you might not, but somebody within your community might know how to do that. 
somebody, uh, we were working with a group in Sunset Park, and it happened that one of the people who uh, was there had been an architectural photographer. And so she taught everyone how to take proper pictures and document the area. It was incredibly helpful. Another, uh, the benefits of coalitions also work on a, on a more sort of human level that you have the opportunity to learn from other people's mistakes and successes and you get mutual support. This is any campaign, any civic campaign is a long haul and it's really important to have people who are in it with you so they can at least understand the, what you're going through. Finally, it also gives you a bigger seat at the table when you represent decision makers that you speak for a large group of interested parties. It's more than just you, it's the block association. It's more than just the block association, it's the neighborhood association. We speak with the voice of the people. Community steps to a successful preservation campaign. These are simply strategies. Again, you have to identify the stakeholders. Who owns the property or the properties that you are concerned about? Who are the people who care about it? Who are your natural allies? Who makes the decisions affecting that property? Um, it is very important to be able to target your advocacy to the right outlet. Um, a lot of times you see people just sending petitions to the community board, which is a wonderful thing. However, the community board is advisory. What you want to be doing is sending petitions to the decision maker, the actual uh, local elected official or the property owner. And outreach is the most important thing that a community can do in order to, be, to gain success at a you know, pursuing their preservation goals. Education is part of outreach. You're gonna talk about landmarking and people are not gonna know what it means. So you're gonna to have to explain what landmarking means. Don't worry, I'm gonna to get to that. And also you have to talk about its benefits and responsibilities. Do not be afraid to admit to responsibilities. That is a natural inclination. You want to say, oh no, everything's perfect. It is very good, but there are also some responsibilities that will happen. You want to, when you're doing your education, you want to be very specific about the site. You want to use programs such as plaques and brochures and guidebooks. You want people to appreciate and cherish the site as much as you do. You want to get them involved. You want to create takeaways like buttons and shirts because people like swag and people also will remember the site once they leave it. Remember that we are dealing in a place-based situation. So once you leave that place, you need a way to remind them of it. You wanna create a broader awareness. You wanna make the history accessible. You want, and you can do that by sponsoring tours like walking tours and house tours. House tours are one of the most effective means of getting people involved with trying to preserve a community because everybody is nosy and everybody enjoys looking at how other people live. You also, want to uh, debunk some myths about preservation because you will find if you are involved getting involved in this that everybody knows more than you do regardless of how much you've actually done the work and they have some hard set ideas about what preservation means for themselves for their community and for their family so here are some myths um, so for example you will hear that historic preservation increases the his affordable housing crisis. Um, now, there actually are a number of forces that affect affordable housing, which are zoning, high land cost, land availability, and development cost. Those are the forces that affect uh, affordable housing. There have been a number of, for example, articles recently in the newspaper about how restrictive zoning is, is, is causing uh, a housing crisis. However, historic designation does not dictate use. It doesn't prevent the redevelopment of a designated historic property into affordable housing. Here's an example of the Al uh, Alhambra Apartments in Brooklyn that were completed in 1890. It's an individual landmark, was converted in 1998 and contains, uh, contains 46 affordable housing units. Um, that's just one example of a historic property that has been developed into affordable subsidized housing. Um, there's also the myth that historic preservation, you know, sort of a collateral myth, a comorbid myth as you were, 
and that historic preservation raises the rents, uh, which is not true. Um, we did a very long, very, very dry um, report about comparing the overall, uh, we being the historic district council, being the overall housing burden that are, um, that New Yorkers are facing. And uh, we found between 1970 and 2010, historic designation had little or no impact on rental prices. That the number of households paying more than 35% of their income on rent did not change in significantly different rates in the areas with historic districts than they did in other neighborhoods. And rental prices did not increase significantly more in historic districts than they did in other neighborhoods. Um, frankly, New Yorkers are, uh, it's a very expensive city to live in, but historic designation has not, is, is, is not one of the causes of that. So let's talk about controlling the property, all right? So uh, the most common means of controlling the property, if you can't buy it and you actually still want to do something about it, is through government oversight and regulation, i.e. site control. And the two principal means of that are through zoning and through landmark designation. Zoning determines uh, the building envelope and usage. Uh, this is an example of uh, what zoning can prevent uh, or, 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 in, or discourage um, in a recent zoning change to prevent excessive empty voids in the middle of buildings. Um, zoning affects an entire area. It is not a specific site that's actually illegal to spot zone. So when you're looking at, uh, you're looking at uh, at least a number of blocks when you're zoning. Now, the benefits of zoning are that it does affect a broad area. You can actually um, work on a zoning plan for an entire neighborhood, uh, and it should utilize rational planning, meaning that you have your goals to set, you set out goals, you set out reasonable goals, and you can rationalize why they are important. Um, the drawbacks for zoning is that it is deliberately exclusive. It is a very professionalized process that excludes uh, common people pretty often. Um, there's a lot of jargon. There is an entire plan. Uh, there's an entire well-educated and, and usually quite friendly profession of planners that um, sort of talk to themselves and while they engage with the community. Um, it really does become sort of a professional process that unfortunately is a little impenetrable for most. And it's very, very, very political, especially in New York City. Um, a former uh, elected official once said at a Historic Districts Council event that real estate in New York is what oil is to Texas. And any large scale plan that affects real estate in New York is going to come up against those vested interests um, that more often than not wield a great deal of political power. So let's talk about landmark designation. Oh, the other thing about zoning also is that it only affects the building envelope. It does not talk about the specifics of detail or aesthetics, especially in New York City. There is no aesthetic regulation. So if your concern is about the actual physical character of the air, of a building, um, you know, its roof line, uh, the, physical, the physical fabric, its detail, zoning is not gonna help you. So let's talk about landmark designation. Now there are two, lat kind, two levels of landmark designation that um, run on parallel tracks. There's state and national register of historic places, and then there's local New York City landmark designation. Now, what landmarking does is it regulates all physical development. It discourages demolition. It requires rudimentary maintenance of a property. It and finally, it requires government permission and encourages community input on private development. This is particularly true with regard to local landmarking. Landmarking does not affect the use. So if you are concerned about the retention of a favor, uh, your favorite restaurant, landmarking the restaurant's not gonna save the restaurant, it's gonna save the space. 
which is it doesn't maintain specific businesses. Gage and Tolner, which was supposed to open except the stay-at-home order happened, um, had was designated as a landmark in the 1970s. Um, it went out of business. It got reinvented eventually as uh, as a Friday, as a TJI Fridays, and then um, or maybe it was an Arby's, and then eventually it was a discount jewelry store before coming under before closing and then getting um, reopening or will reopen someday as um, as a restaurant. So even though it was the individual land interior landmark, it was that was not able to that landmark designation was not able to save the store. What it was able to do was maintain the store and ensure that it existed until the proper stewards could be found. Landmarking also does not require restoration. And because this is New York City and nothing is easy, landmarking doesn't really provide financial incentives for development. So how do you designate a landmark? Uh, the, let's, the, <clears throat> the designations of landmarks, and I will go through the actual process, but you need a couple of sort of seek, uh, a couple of, of ingredients to begin with, which are you need community support, you need political support, and community support translates into political support. The property or area needs to have an inherent worth. We're talking about architectural, cultural, or historical. And they're, generally speaking, should, there? it's relatable to the level of threat to the historic site. Um, simply because you are trying to deal with the discretionary act of government and government by its nature does not wish to react quickly, it is, uh, you need to have a driving reason for government to act. The obstacles to landmark designation in no particular order are the community or the property owner's opposition, which then translates into political opposition. A lack of integrity to the historic site's character, um, you know, the loss of a cornice, uh, the complete ref uh, refacing of a facade, um, the loss of buildings within a historic district. And then, of course, back to the bureaucratic inertia and lack of agency resources, which is that um, the Landmarks Commission, if we're talking about that, is a very small city agency with a very broad mandate, and sometimes they just don't have the people or the money to get to things in time. So I've been talking about a lot about local landmarking. I'm gonna step backwards and just talk, because it comes up occasionally, about state and national register, which was the first track I'd spoken about earlier. A property that's on the state, na a state and national register landmark is a district, site, building, or structure that possesses integrity of design, setting materials, workmanship association, and is 50 years, 50 years old or older, that are criteria A, associated with events that made a significant contribution to broad patterns of our history, such as um, a battlefield, a, civil, a, a revolutionary war battlefield, B, are associated with the lives of significant persons of our past, such as one of our founding fathers, um, or, you know, John Adams or George Washington. C, embody distinct characteristics um, of a type, period, or method of construction or represent the work of a master, like Monticello, that was uh, designed by Jefferson, or uh, a building designed by, let's say, H.H. Um, uh, Richardson. Um, or D, have yielded or likely to yield information important to history or prehistory. That's architectural, that's archaeological resources. But here's the kicker. It needs to be placed on the National Register of Historic Places by the U.S. Department of the Interior. The U.S. Department of the Interior gets a nomination through various state, the State Office of Historic Preservation. So something's not on the National Register unless it's been placed on the National Register. Like Graceland, for example, where it was associated with Elvis, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to explain to you about the importance of Elvis. A New York City landmark is any physical improvement or landscape feature, any part of which is 30 years old or older, has a special character, special historic, or aesthetic interest or value as part of the development 
heritage or cultural characteristics of the city, state, or nation that has been designated by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. If it has not been designated by the Landmarks Preservation Commission, it is not a local landmark. It doesn't matter if it's very old and much beloved. It's not a landmark. It doesn't matter if someone told you it was a landmark because and unless it has been designated by the Landmarks Commission. Similarly, unless something has been listed on the register, it is not on the National Register. It's just an old beloved building. The purpose and in fact the underlying code of the New York City Landmarks Law, which is part of the Administrative Code, it states that landmarks protect the city's heritage, they stabilize and improve property values, they foster civic pride, they enhance tourism, they strengthen the economy, and they promote public education. These are the reasons enumerated within the administrative code for why, for the importance of landmarks and why the government comes in and in, creates landmarks. This is not your opinion, this is part of the administrative code. There are, uh, this is a slightly outdated number, um, over 1,400 individual landmarks, for example, the New York City Public Library, um, the main branch, there are 149 districts and his, historic district extension, historic districts and extensions. Forgive me, um, that range from Gansevoort Market, which is a, a market district on the west side of Manhattan, uh, to Carroll Gardens, which is a painfully small row house district in uh, in Brooklyn, uh, in the Brownstone Belt. Uh, we just heard the 150th proposed historic district, which is Manita Street in the South Bronx. There are 120 interior landmarks. Interior landmarks are very rare landmarks um, that are noted. They typically need to be uh, accessible by the public and they are interiors that have been deemed like Gage and Tolner to be part of our heritage as a city. The Chrysler Building, of course, is not of course, but the Chrysler Building is one for its Art Deco design and the Waldorf Astoria, which was recently designated in 2017, when there was concerns about the conversion of the Waldorf from being a hotel to condominiums. There are, uh, there might be 12 scenic landmarks now. I need to look up that number. Uh, the most recent of which being the Regalman Boardwalk in Coney Island. Uh, here is Central Park. Scenic landmarks uh, are, all need to be publicly owned. They are a way of the acknowledging and hopefully protecting the historic character of these public properties that are um, scenic in their nature. Now, everyone's like, oh my God, there are so many landmarks in New York, especially if you read the, new, the real estate papers. But um, as you can see, 97% of New York City is not under the aegis of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. The Landmarks Commission only covers 3% of the properties in New York. So um, being a landmark property is not creating a stranglehold of any means by development within New York. The difference between a New York City landmark and listing on the National Register of Historic Places are, uh, it, it can seem murky, but here's, here's a, a, a Here's sort of a, a brief process. Uh, New York City landmark, when something, a property is a New York City landmark, the Landmarks Commission regulates all development. If something's on the National Register, they only regulate public development, uh, meaning government actions. The city landmarks, uh, the New York City has binding authority over New York City landmarks, meaning that um, if the Landmarks, the Landmarks Commission must give permits to do work. With regards to the National Register, the State Historic Preservation Office has advisory authority, which it can only advise to do things or not. City landmarks do not trigger environmental review when uh, that comes up um, in a zoning situation, um, although National Register do trigger the environmental review. Um, and finally, the city, land city landmarks um, have a limited grants to not-for-profit and income limited 
tax owners. There are grants that are available there. They're reasonably limited. Um, things that are on the National Register actually are have many more incentives. There are tax credits to commercial and income limited property owners for approved rehabilitative tax credits. Um, so in fact, there are more benefits and less restrictions that come when you're on the National Register than on the city landmark from the point of view of the property owner, from the point of view of the community, there are a lot more strength in being a New York City landmark than on the National Register. Let's talk about the city landmarking designation process. The first thing that happens is somebody proposes, uh, it can come from anywhere, it can be a public proposal, it can come from within the agency, but we're gonna specialize in, in public proposals. You, request, you propose a property to the Landmarks Preservation Commission. That is called a request for evaluation, an RFE. In your request for evaluation, here are just some tips and facts. Uh, you want to include good photographs. You want to include clear maps. You want verifiable basic building data, such as block and lot, if you can prove when the property was built, original, uh, original architect. And you want to explain the significance within a context, i.e., is it culturally important? Is it important to New York City's development? Is it important because someone very famous lived there or it was designed by a a uh, remarkable architect, or it was designed for, for a particular reason, or it is well known to be an exemplary example of a certain kind of architectural style. On your request for evaluation, do not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We have seen, we've worked with groups that have spent literally years working on a request for evaluation because they were concerned about the formatting. At a certain point, it can be good enough. You want to make the case, however, for your proposal, and even in a best case scenario, the Landmarks Preservation Commission will have to redo the research because it is going to eventually be, in a best case scenario, um, a city document that they can feel confident about the research. So provide them with primary source research, but don't go bonkers doing it because they're just going to have to retread the same paths. If interested, the LPC will have several meetings with stakeholders, which are advocates, elected officials, and most important, affected property owners. Um, this is one of actually, uh, in with regard to the landmarks designation process, this is a situation now, of course, because we are under this public health crisis, the Landmarks Commission is having a very hard time reaching out to community prop, community owners, so um, the designation process has slowed way down. But this is still the critical stage for advocacy where energy needs to be expended getting the agency to act. This is when you do your postcard campaign. This is when you have your rallies. This is when you have your petitions going on, all of which are great, but remember you need to be focused at the right decision maker and need to be focused to getting the agency to act. The agency, the LPC, sets their calendar for a hearing and it behooves community advocates to keep the momentum going through press and pressure. Um, sometimes things are calendared and then they sit on the calendar for a really long time, we're talking years. Um, currently, they can only sit on the calendar for, a, a historic district may only sit on the calendar for two years before getting um, summarily taken off. That was a, a new addition by the city council that we were not in favor of. But we, the fact is that once the LPC sets their mind to doing something, it still is imperative to keep the pressure up to make sure it actually has that public hearing. And at that public hearing, you want to get everybody you know to show up or submit testimony. If you ever, if Robert De Niro ever, you know, filmed a um, movie in your neighborhood, now is the time to approach him and say, could you write a letter of support? The LPC votes on the designation and the property is landmarked. That's not the end of the story, but the property at that point counts as officially landmarked. Then there's a public process for, for confirmation, which takes 140 days maximum after landmarks acts. 
that it goes to the city planning commission for an advisory opinion. They've got 60 days to vote. It goes to the city council for a vote. And this is where you need to stick the landing because it's the last chance for everything to go wrong. We have seen, especially nowadays, um, a number of individual properties get denied at the city council because at the last second, property owners will come in and do a, um, a sort of a last minute rush on council members and the council member go, oh, sure, I don't want to cause any trouble. So you need to monitor the situation and continue advocating to the decision makers to uphold the landmark designation. For example, 184 Kent, the Austin Nichols Warehouse building in Williamsburg was uh, ended up back in 2005 um, becoming uh, de-designated by the city council. This was a, a case where we had a rally and these were, we had three separate hearings before the city council um, and these are people uh, rallying there. Um, it then goes to the mayor for a vote. In this case, uh, in case the mayor is vetoing council action. Now, the mayor is going to support a landmark designation if the Landmarks Commission votes to designate it because the Landmarks Commission is a mayoral agency and they are doing the mayor's, they, 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 they act at the mayor's um, behest. So the mayor is going to be on the side of his agency. In the case that the mayor is vetoing council action, like he actually did at 184 Kent, where the city council overturned the Landmarks Commission, Mayor Bloomberg then vetoed their overturn. The council has an opportunity, because of the balance of powers, to overturn that veto. They need a supermajority to do that. Um, and in the case of 184 Kent, they did. However, usually speaking, then they get landmarked. This is, of course, Webster Hall, down the, down the street from HDC's offices, which we greatly miss. And you need to remember to celebrate. You worked really, really hard doing this. Um, and, you know, you've got a lot of road ahead of you because once it's designated, designation isn't the end. That's only the beginning. But take a breath, celebrate, raise a glass, tell your stories, and tell your stories, and, and make sure that people uh, know what you did and can celebrate that. If you have any questions, um, I will now stop sharing. Uh, that's my email, sbankov at hgc.org. Um, and I'm going to, uh, I've been speaking very quickly. Um, and let me see if there are any questions in the chat. Um, <laughs> uh, Lewis, yeah, well, you can all see that for yourself. Um, do please feel free to, if you have any questions or if you would like me to go into depth about something else, uh, I realize I, I was going pretty fast. I'm also happy to share that presentation with anybody if they want it. So, okay, well, um, seeing, let me just check here. Can I verbally ask you something? Um, sure, yeah, we're a small group. Go right yeah. ahead. Who am I speaking to, please? You know, the whole problem with designating a historic district is the fact that there's no controls on the area outside the historic district. And that's when gentrification sets in and, and the whole experience of the neighborhood drastically uh, goes down because of that. Um, that's, well, that's, that's, that's a couple of different, um, aspects. Uh, gentrification is a complex urban phenomenon that has very little to do with uh, historic district desi designation or any kind of landmark designation. It's actually been shown that um, they kind of go on parallel tracks, but uh, they, it, it has been shown that actually what people con are concerned about with regard to gentrification um, are affected by different, very different things than landmark designation. Perforce, the, you can't designate everything. Uh, the Landmarks Commission is prescribed to only regulate its historic district. You cannot, um, they can't really regulate properties, the other 97% of the properties in New York City. 
Um, there are, of course, ways that those properties could be better regulated to help to, to help maintain their character. And in certain historic districts, um, there are, uh, there is uh, zoning that is more contextual to the built fabric around the historic districts to sort of absorb the natural um, inclination to build high right around a historic district because it's so attractive. Um, I see that uh, Leo is asking, is there a question, difference between the state and national registers of historic places? Um, functionally, not really. Um, there are, it, it, the National Register of Historic Places is based on the 1966 National Historic Preservation Act. The New York State Register of Historic Places is, ba is based on the 1981 New York State Preservation Act, which uh, mirrored the national one. Um, it kind of goes basically the state historic preservation office first puts it on the state register and then they send it down to Washington um, where the national register is kept. Functionally speaking, there is very, very little difference between the two and there are very few buildings, very few, that are not um, on the, uh, that are not on both of those as well. Um, there, uh, there's a question of a wonder if more favorable landmarks commission under new leadership. Um, Sarah Carroll, who was a long time uh, employee of the landmarks commission. Um, I met Sarah back in 1993 when she was had her first job at the LPC and I was working in um, advocacy. Um, actually, I wasn't, I wasn't in an advocacy position, but I was working in, in nonprofit and historic preservation. Sarah is incredibly devoted to the continued uh, existence of the Landmarks Commission and is very protective of it and has a, a strong sense of the preservation community, which some of her forebears did not have as much. Um, so indeed, uh, and, and she is an old friend who has a long history in the community. So on a personal basis and a professional basis, we, it's, it's a lot easier to communicate with her than with some of her forebears, uh, predecessors. Um, and I think that we are all slightly in, within the civic community, we're all slightly assured that she will be continue to be protective of the agency. That being said, um, it's still a government agency. And in fact, whether or not one likes him or dislikes him, the mayor is only in until the end of 2021. So um, regard, and there will be a new mayor. He will be forced out because of term limits and um, there will probably be a new landmarks commission. So it's, it's much more important to keep your eye on the ball with regards to institutional. Uh, than, than personal aspects. Um, there was a question about, yes, uh, do historic districts generally need to be contiguous? Um, what if lots, some lots or blocks that were changed over time with modern buildings? Um, they do need to be contiguous, almost generally speaking. Um, modern buildings are not necessarily uh, a problem within historic districts. There are uh, a number of modern buildings that are built in historic districts uh, with the Landmarks Preservation Commission's uh, permission. So it, it more depends on whether or not there are vacant lots, there are um, buildings that are very, it's not the modernity of it, but are they very out of place? And if you have a large, a, 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 you know, you might be able to say, oh, if we, you know, there's one building in the middle of a street that <clears throat> does not have the historic character, we can kind of look beyond that. But if you start losing whole halves of blocks, you will, the Landmarks Commission will probably say, no, that is not, um, we're going to stop drawing the line over there. Um, there was something about sacred sites. Um, the sacred sites designation on um, our colleagues at the New York Landmarks Conservancy run the Sacred Sites program um, who work to help, uh, they work to help aid and assist um, the physical plants of historic houses of worship throughout all of New York State. Um, 
they have a grant program. They um, bring a lot of professional and uh, resources to bear. They've got a, a very good uh, list of people who are very uh, professionals who are used to working with churches, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's it. Um, all the properties, or most of the properties, they look at all historic houses of worship and they do some great surveys and they talk to anybody uh, in order to get money through the sacred, sacred sites program. I believe you need to be at least listed on the national register or in the process of getting listed on the national register. You want to talk to our colleague, Ann Friedman at the New York landmarks conservancy, which is uh, just Google New York landmarks conservancy and, and they'll be able to give you some information there um and then that is an interesting question from deb with regards to if the homes are original but have been modified by vinyl siding additions etc um it depends on how modified it depends on is it good vinyl siding is it bad vinyl siding there have been, uh, and you find this in a lot of the lower density suburban style neighborhoods <clears throat> in New York City, a great deal of, of New York City is actually low density suburban style neighborhoods. There's, there's a huge chunk of it in Brooklyn, uh, most of Queens, Staten Island, few portions of the Bronx are wood frame houses. And um, you have a, a, a situation where wood, wood you know does not maintain forever and at a certain point in the 20th century uh vinyl siding was regarded as a as a, as a cure-all if the buildings are really it, it depends if the buildings are um you can still see the form you can still if the, if the neighborhood still has a feel a stark feel to it um and you can see through the siding um, often under vinyl siding, the original clabbered is there. It just requires some work, uh, some work on it. So I, I would not say necessarily that just vinyl siding is 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 the death of historic designation. Um, in fact, we were working in Richmond Hill in Queens, if you know it, uh, for a very long time, and over the course of 15 years, enough of the buildings ended up removing and renovating properly so that we did actually get it on the National Register of Historic Places after it, be, after it was rejected uh, in the early 2000s. There's now a uh, reasonably sized uh, National Register Historic District in Richmond Hill that we, we got through. So um, it depends, it's, it, I, I can't say a definitive yes or no. Um, Greenpoint, uh, as someone, as, someone mentioned is a sea of bad vinyl and you've seen since the Greenpoint designation in the 70s um, there is a, a number of those buildings have been returned you also see that in Douglaston um, in Queens some of the buildings have been some of those buildings um, have actually the modern buildings have been demolished and new contextual buildings have been built are there any other questions um, how does, uh, the question is, how does uh, LPC or SHPO um, work on uh, energy compliant, affect energy compliance codes? Um, that's a complex question, but actually you can. I know that at one point, um, a few years ago, the State Historic Preservation Office was working with the New York State uh, Energy Department to uh, really encourage uh, incentives. Um, that would allow for new, for alternative forms of energy. Uh, you can get property incentives and stuff like that um, through the state uh, doing proper rehabilitation and bringing things up to code in an appropriate way. The Landmarks Commission is generally speaking incredibly um, happy to work with building applicants to bring things up to code. Uh, the majority of code that happens are also, are the interiors of properties uh, and not don't necessarily affect the outsides of properties. And um, in that sense, the Landmarks Commission is simply advisory, making sure that you're not punching holes through old walls. Um, the question of Jerome Park Reservoirs on the State and National Register, are city-owned public utility structures eligible for landmarking? 
Yes, although, um, and, and in fact, there are, the city owns a number, all, all scenic landmarks, for example, are publicly owned. Um, utility structures uh, can also be designated. Um, they're the IRT powerhouse on the west side of Manhattan on 57th Street, 58th Street, um, was recently designated. Um, when it is a city owned property, that doesn't necessarily mean just because of city owned landmarks um, are treated differently with regards to regulation. Uh, we've seen a number of city owned landmarks, often public schools, um, get demolished uh, because of other reasons, and it depends on which the lead agency is. So um, it's tr I think that the Jerome Park Reservoir probably should be a, a scenic landmark. Um, but that's, it still would not necessarily be regulated um, any differently than it is now, uh, especially because parks in the city are, um, are naturally going to the Public Design Commission uh, for design review. Does majority rule for homeowners input or does it, LPC take more into consideration? Um, the Landmarks Commission, uh, by statute, there is no owner consent. However, um, in reality and in practice, the Landmarks Commission is not going to come in and designate, especially a historic district, over the, um, over the arguments of a majority of homeowners. Um, they want to have, they, they basically, they are reliant on the majority of people wanting to comply with the landmarks law, otherwise it won't work. So, and there are a number of, of neighborhoods that want landmarking, um, so they're not gonna waste their time and their you know, fairly scant resources in um, inflicting their will if there's a really negative feeling in the neighborhood. In fact, um, <clears throat> the Harrison, the long proposed Harrison Street Historic District uh, was rejected eventually and taken off the calendar because the Landmarks Commission felt that there was not enough community support, even though they had gone through the whole effort of calendaring it um, after a lot of work by neighborhood activists and by the Historic Districts Council. We're incredibly disappointed in that decision and we hope that they will reverse themselves. But Again, that was a situation where the community, it was the, the agency felt the community was not supportive and it would not be a successful designation. Okay. Um, unless I'll give everyone a, a, a moment or two, um, but it is, it's, it's, Closing in on seven o'clock and we promised everyone could go home. We, uh, again, thank you all very, very much for spending this hour with me. Um, I hope you've learned something. Uh, do please uh, keep your eyes open. We are continuing our, uh, our preservation school next week. Um, it'll be listed on our website, which is hdc.org um, under events. And, um, you know, we are happy to provide this content for free, but we do rely on people's um, generosity in order to keep the lights on. So thank you all very, very much. I hope you have a good evening and uh, stay safe. Simeon, before you close out, can you get into my last question? Uh, your last question, okay, where are we? Uh, Lewis, um, exterior work, does it need, need to be done in the same materials as the original? Um, the Landmarks Commission, um, Sorry, I missed that. Uh, the Landmarks Commission actually has a evolving standard with regards to new materials. It depends on the materials per se. Um, there have been actually remarkable, uh, there have been uh, remarkable advances in building technology, and you will you will find that actually there are some good, uh, more in, more inexpensive, more affordable. Uh, substitute materials that that exist and are regularly approved. It really depends on the specifics of the situation, but um, the Landmarks Commission is very eager to try to work with um, 
homeowners in order to make something right and make it uh, possible and capable. They, they do not wish to be deleterious and um, harsh to people, especially if a situation, if it's not a primary facade, uh, if it's a secondary facade or a tertiary facade, it's the re if it's back, if it's, if it's not visible by the, by, from the public way, um, it is held to a much lessened standard than the original. All right, everybody, thanks, Simeon, uh, for this great presentation. Uh, go into the reactions at the bottom and give them a nice uh, clap or a thumbs up. Thanks so very much, Lewis. Okay. Take care, everyone. Ah, oh, very sweet. Thank you.